with the understanding of laws of physics that we understand now, expanding universe is an actual, um, it's the natural prediction of the general relativity um, of Einstein. And, and, and this uh, requires a bit of an explanation. Um, let's see, what's the best way to do this? I don't know if your textbook goes through it. Um, I think there, they might be mentioned in uh, one of the sections we skipped. Um, let me search for Einstein field equations. My uh, Einstein equations. Um, I know the textbook does talk about general relativity here. Um, yeah, they might not. Um, I mean, you know, they talk about general relativity, but they might not um, explicitly talk about the Einstein field equations because it's quite mathematical. I will tell you that, um, that sorry, it's kind of, beyond my can. <laughs> it, it, uh, so this is describing the conceptual ideas of general relativity. And I think if you read through it, a lot of this, I think it makes sense now for the cosmologists <laughs> who actually do work with the general relativity. These, uh, they have a sophisticated mathematical tool to do that. And that sophisticated mathematical tool is called Einstein field equations and um, and this is the formula that encapsulates the general relativity. And it, uh, um, it takes a whole course to even to, or half a course to introduce the notations that they use here. I will just tell you that this is the mathematical expression for uh, general relativity. This is a differential equation. It, uh, it involves graduate level mathematics. So I want quite, going to that because I can't. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, Einstein actually could have predicted the, the expanding universe. So the Einstein equation is quite complicated. So when you work through all the, the notations, uh, I don't think, yeah, so I, let me not bother doing. Uh, this stands for a nonlinear differential equation. And it's uh, much more complicated than the inverse square law you have seen with uh, Newton's universal gravitation. Um, but you can try to make some predictions with simplifying assumptions. And um, what one attempt at that making prediction, it uh, I think if I search for something called FRW metric, it'll come up. Um, yeah, Friedman, Lim. Matra, I can't pronounce these names. I think his name is actually mentioned in your textbook. Robertson, oh, and Walker metric. Oh, I guess I'm remembering Friedman, Robertson, Walker. Oh, why, why am I forgetting it? I don't know. FRW metric is what I learned when I was in school, uh, when I was taking general relativity class. So this is, on, as it says, it's an exact solution of Einstein's field equations. Now, because it's... Um, uh, the field equations are quite complicated. In order to obtain an exact solution, they have to uh, make a quite a bit of simplifying assumption. So they assume that, okay, you got some matter and density of energy and whatever that's uh, homogeneous and isotropic. See if that sounds familiar. That's uh, what we described our universe as under cosmological principle. So this is something that I, we think has some applicability to our universe. And what it predicts is that under these conditions, uh, the Einstein field equations predict um, um, outcome that has an expanding universe or after some period of expansion, then contracting universe. Um, but the key thing here is that, um, that the, the, the laws of general relativity, as we understand it, it, it predicts an expanding universe as one of the possible outcomes. And, and that's uh, where we fit uh, Hubble's discovery into our cosmology that we, live in a universe that's currently expanding. 
So, um, so if you run the clock backward, then it's a contracting universe. And this is something that we would expect to happen as far as we can take the, uh, the principles of general relativity. And, um, and we think that goes quite far. And that's the, that leads you back to the singularity at the beginning of the universe. So, um, yeah, and it's describing the Lambda CDM model, which is what we call Big Bang cosmological model. And I, I guess that this is um, <laughs> um, a lot to take in all at once and to try to describe. So I think uh, what I would do best to do my time uh, best to do with my remaining 15 minutes of time is giving you some um, some evidence for this model. And so when you have a scientific model, these are some of the things that scientists in their scientific way <laughs> might scientifically do. You make a prediction. So you look at, okay, what are some consequences of this new idea? And you look for these, um, these consequences that your new idea predicts. So, so you can kind of connect to the dots here this way. You have Einstein's field equations expressing general relativity. That's your starting place. Einstein discovered this new property of space and time <laughs> in the presence of uh, mass and gravity. And um, you have some simplifying assumptions that we think is largely true in something that applies to homogeneous and isotropic initial conditions. And you uh, come to conclusion oh, that describes an expanding universe. And in fact, Hubble, um, Hubble's observation says that we are in an expanding universe. And by the way, this is what I, why Einstein called this uh, invention of cosmological constant his greatest blunder, because he invented the cosmological constant in order to keep the universe stationary, stable. Uh, he thought expanding universe that changes over time was not a, he didn't like it philosophically. So he added a term to his set of equations to make that happen. And then he learned of Hubble's discovery. He immediately regretted it. That's why he called it his greatest blunder. So, so we are in the expanding universe. And now taking the conclusion further, what you're saying is then, okay, then in an earlier time, universe was smaller, which means um, the same amount of mass and energy that's in the universe was packed into a smaller volume, greater energy density. So the universe was a little bit hotter and you keep doing that, doing that, keep contracting up until the point where the temperature of the universe is so high that, that you think the laws of physics as applied then would be substantially different from laws of physics that we know now. But here's the thing, uh, the laws of physics that we know now, it applies to quite a bit of high temperatures. At the core of stars like our sun, it's at 100 million Kelvin. And our we think our understanding of nuclear physics applies there. In fact, we know it does because we built thermonuclear bomb that <laughs> reproduces that exact condition. Um, so, so we are describing a universe that's quite hot and compact, uh, very energetically dense, something that's almost like the conditions of the core of the stars, except everywhere in the universe. Um, and that's quite different universe than what we are used to seeing. And when you go down that road that far, that, um, that you, um, follow this path from realizing that we are in the expanding universe, that if you run the clock backward, there was a time when all that mass, all that energy was packed into such a small volume that um, it was a, the entire universe was a giant fireball. Then, then something like that must have had... Um, some lasting impact that you could measure. 